Amidst the complication of human dealings, we often turn oblivious to the beings with whom we share our pale blue dark. Hidden under the canopies and beneath the surface is a world existing from our time before our own, mysteries of which await to be revealed. Welcome to another episode of Zeroing In. I am Shreya Mishra and hosting this episode with me today is Naman Jain. Our guest for today is an evolutionary biologist and professor pursuing research in the extremely lush and immersive field of ecology, working majorly along the lines of evolutionary ecology of species interactions. She pursued her bachelor's and master's degree in zoology from the University of Bombay and further went on to pursue her doctoral degree from the University of Miami, USA working in ecology, evolution, and behavioral science. Further from there, she held a visiting faculty position at Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, and later also served as the Deputy Director of Research at the Bombay National History Society. Subsequently, she went on to join the Center for Ecological Sciences at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and is currently a professor there. Her research interests lie in the evolutionary ecology of species interactions, investigating the chemical and visual ecology of such interactions, while also partaking in fundamental research towards practical applications. Her research has taken her to study the forests, jungles, and myriad of ecologically rich systems across the world, including the forests of Panama, Costa Rica and the Western Ghats, exploring the intricate relationships that different species share in order to survive in the wild. In our conversation with her, we talked about her adventures and expeditions of the world beyond human dealings, which in turn intertwine to understand our own place in this beautiful puzzle of life. We discovered the secrets of some intricate relationships existing in the wild and details that go into studying such systems. A very warm welcome to Dr. Renee Maria Burgess. Thank you so much, Shreya. I'm quite overwhelmed with that introduction. Thank you. We'd like to start off the conversation with a very basic question about your formative years, about your curiosities while you were growing up. So can you tell us how you got into this field of zoology and ecology and where did it take root when you were a child? You know, I am one of those rare people, not rare, I think the one of those fortunate people who work in a field that I have always been passionate about. And I always tell my students and other people that it seems a bit ridiculous that somebody is paying me to have fun. You know, so uh, this is something that I think maybe when I was five, six, seven years old, I realized that I had a passion for uh, insects or birds or, you know, anything that was uh, alive and uh, moving. And uh, I had pets. I had parents who were very supportive of my interests. And I think uh, having had that kind of a supportive uh, background, I just was encouraged to do whatever I wanted, you know, and uh, seek whatever found and uh, took my interest. And I think in that sense, I'm really uh, fortunate to have been allowed to follow my passion. And I initially, you know, when you're young and you don't know the scope of things, I had a feeling, well, maybe I might become a vet because I loved animals and cats and dogs and, you know, things like that. But then slowly I, and I I must uh, tell, say one thing, Today, we watch National Geographic on uh, the screen, right? We have National Geographic channel. 
But in those days, uh, that was before television. Can you imagine a time before television? So this was before television. And uh, we used to get at home the National Geographic magazine, you know, the, the hard copies. And I remember browsing through one issue, which had beautiful pictures of a scientist who was studying hummingbirds. And I still remember this in my mind. There was this lovely image of um, hummingbirds that were being carried from one place to another place, and they were all wrapped up live hummingbirds wrapped up very nicely in flannel with um, you know a sugar solution so that they could feed on and the article is just beautifully written about this interaction between hummingbirds and flowers and i think that particular article has always stayed in my mind and I think maybe that sort of sparked something in me to say, you know, I would like to do the kinds of things that uh, scientists like these do to uh, do all these fascinating things and study these or birds and organisms. And, uh, so, and I was really young then. I must have been seven or eight years old. But that passion, I can say, um, has never left me. <laughs> you know, my family uh, thought I might become a doctor because I do come from a family where lots of people are doctors. But, um, and I could have easily got into medical college at that time. And I remember my mother being very worried. And, you know, when I said I wanted to do zoology, uh, everybody saying, but you know, what will you do with zoology? And I remember saying that uh, if all I can do with zoology is to, you know, in those days, we just had a little microscope or something, a tiny little one. So I said, if all I can do is just, you know, look down a microscope and look at some fascinating creatures. And if somebody is willing to give me a little money for doing that, uh, I don't need much else, you know. So I think uh, that must have convinced my family that uh, I was a bit uh, crazy up here. And uh, they very thankfully allowed me to do exactly what I wanted. Yes. So I think, uh, you know, if one starts early with a deep passion and you have a uh, indulgent environment around you. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, all you really need. You need uh, some support, but more importantly, you need a passion. Yeah, um, it's, it's wonderful how beautifully and simply you put your passion about a seven-year-old girl, just wanting to look at the beauties of the world. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think one needs to, this is what I, I tell, um, yes, you need to be able to to find uh, questions everywhere, you know, everywhere you look. I, I remember, not to go off too much on a tangent, but since you talked about Costa Rica, I was very fortunate uh, when I was doing my PhD in, in Florida. Uh, there is this fantastic two-month field course which is run in Costa Rica by the Organization for Tropical Studies. And uh, I remember I applied for that. I was a graduate student and, um, you know, got in and went to Costa Rica. And uh, what struck me, the very first day of this course is we were asked to walk in this beautiful forest and at the end of the day come back to the instructors with 100 questions written down on a piece of paper. We didn't know anything about this forest. We were just asked to walk by ourselves and just look around us and uh, think about questions, whether we knew the plant or the animal or the insect, it didn't matter. But just think about 
what are the kinds of questions you might would like to ask. And for me, I, I thought that was a fantastic exercise, you know, because uh, you're just there and uh, nobody is going to, we were told very clearly that uh, the sillier the question, perhaps, you know, it didn't matter at all. And uh, we really enjoyed that exercise. There were 20 or, 20 or 25 of us from all over uh, doing this course together in this two month period. And uh, it really uh, helped me to realize that you can look at a leaf or the roots or you know anything and come up with fascinating questions. It's really interesting to hear how you talk about these these excursions from the period of a graduate study almost in such a meditative way. It's 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 quite interesting to look at it. But uh, I actually had a question regarding your doctoral thesis since we're talking about it or your doctoral work where you worked on understanding the giant squirrels as 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 it says. We were only able to uh, go through the abstract, but then that led to uh, probably a ten different nested research articles. <laughs> Uh, which which we had to go through to be able to understand even a minuscule bit. Would you be able to, or would you like to explain in brief uh, what was the excitement for you when you chose that project? Ah, yes, of course. So for me, I was doing my PhD in in uh, the US, but I knew that I uh, wanted to come to India and do my research. You know, so I worked out a deal where um, I managed to get a grant which would uh, pay for my research in India. So I would come to India and then collect my data for a couple of years and then go back and write up my, my dissertation. And when I was thinking about possibilities of, you know, how would I get a grant uh, as a graduate student, I have to raise money to support my research for a couple of years. And uh, I started thinking, because I was even at that time interested in the interactions between plants and animals, because species interactions. And I was also interested in chemistry, phytochemistry, and how uh, feeding behavior can affect an animal's lifestyle or uh, decisions made by, by animals. And then I realized that the giant squirrel is an endangered species and it is a canopy living animal. And uh, at that time, not much was known about it, but it was believed to be largely feeding on plant material, you know, leaves and fruit. And so I thought that this would be an ideal situation where I would be able to take my interest in uh, phytochemistry because I would be looking at the nutrient and the toxin concentrations of all the, the forest uh, food items that were available to the giant squirrel. And then I would be able to understand about the biology of the squirrel, the nutrient landscape of the forest, because, you know, we see forests differently from how a squirrel sees a forest. Yes, a squirrel would see a forest as patches of resources. Some resources are very nutritious and some are not. Some are poisonous. So I thought it would be a good idea to compare two very different forest areas. So I chose one area in, uh, in the North Canada district near a place called Yellapur in uh, North Karnataka. And I chose another place uh, in Maharashtra, which is part of the Bhima Shankar Wildlife Sanctuary. And I was lucky to get a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They uh, offered to fund me for two years, so that was a stroke of luck. And then I came to India and I had to discover the whole system. I had to start from scratch because nobody knew anything about these giant squirrels, really. And so the first few months I had to spend even finding a good place and I zeroed down on these two places 
because if you want to study animal behavior in the wild, you have to have a place where your study organisms can get accustomed to you so that they become used to you and they are not running away from you because if they have been hunted or hurt in any way or poached, it would be very difficult to study organisms that have had these kinds of work. So it took me a few months to find these two places where I could uh, follow squirrels from morning to night and learn all the secrets about their uh, life and their behavior, their resources, their territoriality, the toxins that they could handle, the chemicals that they couldn't handle in terms of their uh, gastric capacity. So that's how it really started. It gave me an opportunity to get money for my research and gave me the opportunity to be fully independent. So I was living all by myself for two years in these two different places. This grant even gave me money to buy a field vehicle. So I had a Jeep that I was able to drive. So, you know, it was good fun actually to be completely independent and uh, I had my own bank account. I could pay my field assistants and I had my own uh, vehicle. It was a second-hand vehicle which I was able to afford from the ground that I could buy. And um, I must say I had a lot of fun in those two years. I was just thinking, you mentioned when you started off that it was a stroke of luck that you were able to get the grant. And from the way you describe it, it seems like you were awfully prepared. <laughs> the way you must have been able to propose the whole idea must have been quite concrete in that sense. So that is one thing that quite intrigues me. The other part of it, since you've already explained quite a good amount of your personal experiences, I really wanted to ask you about this. You mentioned that, you know, the mechanisms facilitating resource utilization for solitary creatures was something that you were studying. Um, but from the very basic idea of the method methodology, how do you even study such a thing? I mean, if you're even studying a so-called giant squirrel, it's still a squirrel. Ah, okay, these are these are really these are really big squirrels, huh? So from the tip of their nose to the tip of their tail, they are three feet. I, I still think in feet. So they are not like your tiny little ones. They are big and I call them the primates of the squirrel world because just as, you know, monkeys, you can tell the difference between one monkey and another by looking at its face because we are monkeys too, right? So we all look different and we can tell the difference between each other. Uh, giant squirrels are individuals and I, I could tell the difference between each squirrel because each squirrel had very distinctive features. So that was another requirement because when you're studying ecology and you're studying, as I said, you know, resource utilization, you want to look at the nutrient landscape, uh, you want to know whether some individuals are like, you know, some of us humans, we have too many resources, we are very rich, and others are really not so rich and have fewer resources. And this is exactly what I found happens in giant squirrels. So you know, some squirrels have uh, bigger territories that are richer in resources. And the way I could find that out was because I could identify individual squirrels. And because they allowed me to follow them for hours at end. And in these forests, I had marked and uh, got coordinates. There were no GPS businesses in those days. I had uh, thousands of trees marked in these forests. So as a squirrel moved from one tree to another, I could even track the foraging path that the squirrel took from its nest in the morning till it went back in the evening. I could follow it and because they look different and I had, a, I could afford in those days, one of the best 
binoculars, which I still have even today, which cost a thousand dollars in uh, how many 40 years ago. And now don't even ask me how much it might cost. <laughs> that was my most prized possession that uh, um, two prized possessions actually. Well, three prized possessions. I had a waterproof watch. I had a waterproof notebook because I had to be watching squirrels in the rain and the whatever. And uh, amazing binoculars that even under very, very, very low light conditions, I could still look into the canopy. Now squirrels, you know, live up in the canopy. And I could still see clearly exactly which part of the flower, the fruit, the leaf, because squirrels are fabulous chemists. They know exactly what to avoid uh, in a leaf or in a fruit or in a flower. You know, many leaves are protected with a lot of chemicals on the edges of the leaves because that's where the caterpillars start feeding, you know, from the edges. And these squirrels, it's amazing. They would fold the leaf and then take a bite from the center. So that, and they would drop the edges down to the forest floor. Which means that they had figured out that the nasty stuff is on the edge of the leaf, but the good stuff is in the center. And when, <laughs> when we compared the chemical compositions, it was, you know, very apparent that these squirrels are really, you know, fabulous chemists. They really know uh, what they're doing. And so, you know, to cut a long story short, this is really how I was able to establish the nutrient landscape for individual squirrels to see which ones were nutritionally deprived. There were some squirrels that... Um, didn't have sufficient resources in their territories. And quite remarkably, these squirrels would try to increase their protein intake by eating spider webs. Webs are made out of protein. And it was amazing that this female squirrel had very a small territory, not many trees in this territory, not much, not many good resources. And here she is trying to increase her protein intake, almost like a protein bar or something that we would eat today. I saw her going and eating spider webs, which I have not seen in squirrels that had, you know, good resources. So there was such a diversity of interactions and uh, variation that I was able to document, to examine. We all know that, you know, when one is pregnant, you tend to want to increase your calcium intake because, and this is exactly what the squirrels would do. So pregnant and squirrels would eat uh, plant materials that were much higher in calcium. And that's also something that I was able to find out, you know. So there were so many interesting things that you can do just by observation. And then, of course, a lot of uh, chemical analysis also went on, uh, which was another part. But if you do the right kind of observations and you have enough of them, you can uh, uncover many, many secrets. And now learning about these giant squirrels and you, as you say, it was already very diverse. They were rich and the poor even in them. How do you even go about choosing which particular subject to study? Like it's immense. It's diverse as you can, as you already say. So even uh, like further it branches out more and more. So how do you choose your subjects? Like why the giant squirrel in the first place? Well, I, I explained why the giant squirrel because I had the best shot at getting a grant and it fit in with my interest in plant-animal interactions and uh, foraging theory and uh, optimization. 
in terms of you know diets because I also had a background in physiology. So I was my master's was in animal physiology. So I was very interested in uh, nutrients, and I've always been interested in uh, uh, even in my later projects. Uh, so this sort of uh, uh, gave me the opportunity to find a project where I I needed the money. I had to support myself. And uh, I was able to put all the pieces together, which made a good uh, PhD problem also. Yes, because when you're doing a PhD, uh, it can't only be purely descriptive. It's got to have good questions, good analytical techniques, good statistical analysis. So you have to have a question that will bring in all these components, right? Because a PhD is sort of testing you on your ability to A, ask the question, B, go out and solve the problem, C, you know, analyze your data and it's, it's like getting a passport. So uh, that's how I, I chose the giant squirrel problem. And it's always remained very, very dear to me because I had subsequently a couple of one, one student also who did a, a PhD with me on other aspects of the giant squirrel. So uh, it's been a subject that's very close to my heart. This is one of the first areas that I, I went quite deep into. But as you correctly said, the moment you scratch the surface of a problem, you quickly realize that the problem is huge. It's immense. You can go down that path for your entire career. So some people have taken that particular aspect. You know, they have said, okay, I'm going to focus, let's say I'm, I'm a tiger specialist or I'm a wasp specialist. I'm only going to study wasps or I'm only going to study tigers. Yeah. With me, I have too many interests and every single plant and animal organism is fascinating to me. I can't see myself ever tying down, you know, myself to one system because there are a million ideas which are popping up and then you feel, oh, you should do this, you should do that, and, you know, basically. So basically, you fun. went about exploring all the possible fields you could in the limited time that you have. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, with a PhD, you have limited time. You can't go on forever. So, and you've got uh, restrictions. So... Of course, there are always things that uh, will distract you, like, uh, as I remember in uh, the Bhima Shankar area, I would always be distracted by uh, luminescent fungi, because in the monsoon, uh, trees would glow in the night because of the fungus which was luminescent. And I would be able to break off a bit of that uh, bark and use it as a night light, you know, in my room. There are many such things, you know, that are sort of the perks or the fringe benefits of you get to study giant squirrels, which are your main topic. But there are so many other things that you observe and see around you that enrich your uh, understanding, you know. Uh, whether it be uh, gliding lizards or tree frogs or fireflies, whole trees covered and glowing with fireflies. I feel really very sad that uh, with all the pollution and, you know, things, degradation of the environment today, many people don't have the opportunity to see whole trees lit up because of the fireflies. So, uh, in the same uh, uh, vein as you were talking about how you moved further, given that there were so many questions that you were trying to address, and then you addressed the one that you did, you did the dissertation, and then you uh, came back to India. And through the time, I mean, were the uh, techniques that you had devised for yourself, for instance, marking the thousand trees or so that you mentioned during your uh, graduate time, uh, were those techniques that you had to invent for yourself in some sense, or was it like a like a standard thing? For one, 
And second, how do you evolve from there? Like, how do you for, further your questions from there? I mean, for your case, I believe it must have been completely different since you decided to diversify further or study something different from there. Right. So, uh, marking trees was very important. I had to know where the squirrels were and uh, I was looking at maybe even from an engineering perspective, you know, the shortest path back home. There are so many interesting algorithms, you know, uh, if you want to, the traveling salesman problem, you may have heard of it, I don't know, right? So we were, uh, I had a student and we, we did a, a computational analysis of uh, networks and hubs and how whether squirrels were really being efficient in, uh, you know, finding the shortest way back home or, you know, so many other questions. So um, marking trees is not a great technology, you know, you just need in the absence of GPS in those days, I had a, a very primitive sighting compass and uh, uh, one of these surveyor sticks and then, you know, primitive tapes and uh, uh, things that one used to, to mark and to, to get the locations. And I had these huge, gigantic maps that because there weren't good uh, imaging software and uh, there were hardly, uh, there weren't any PCs in those days. It was only, you know, the PC revolution really came in about 1986, by which time I had sort of finished my, uh, collecting my research. That was only when uh, my data, and that was when IBM and, um, you know, was trying to flood college campuses in the US with a lot of, cheaper computers so a lot of us invested but these were giant computers prior to that we would have to uh, write our programs on these computer cards because we had these big mainframe computers that were only in one building in the university and we had to submit our program as a batch process and uh, we had these uh, punch cards which uh, now, now when I think about it, you know. So, but the story I really would like to, to, to link up there, which connects with what something that Shreya asked me. Because we had limited technology, yeah, we had to be very careful that we were not wasting time or resources. What do I mean by this? You know, today uh, you map something wrong, you've got your coordinates wrong, you, you have GPS, you can quickly redo something. In those days, uh, we didn't even have word processing software. We, we Some of us typed our papers on typewriters uh, with that wretched erasing fluid and so what is the point I'm trying to make here? Point I'm trying to make here is you had to be very clear about what you were doing, what you were going to write, and uh, your spelling and your grammar also had to be very good. Why am I saying this? Because you didn't have spell check. You didn't, you didn't have automatic autocorrect. So everything that you did, you had to be really very clear that this is what I'm doing because I can't redo this. I have one shot at doing it. So this, I think, was what perhaps when I said, you know, that in, at that time, one became self-reliant, independent. And you also became uh, very clear about exactly what you wanted to do, how you were going to do it, because you couldn't be doing a hundred drafts. There was no way. It's, I'm sure all of you, and now I'm, I'm in, uh, well, I'm not so much in the bad habit because the old habits still die hard. But I'm always, you know, telling my students, 
just before a, a presentation on their PowerPoint, they are changing this and changing that. We couldn't do that. So we had to know very perfectly. This is what we want to say. This is how they're going to say it. This is how they're going to present. And I really, truly believe that it, it helped us to focus on the true uh, value of things very, very fast. You know, whether it be in terms of uh, time utilization, uh, multitasking. I often, you know, encounter, and I'm sure uh, many, many students who will do what I, I call serial processing, you know, finish one thing, then get to another, and rather than parallel processing. And I feel that, you know, when we were in this business ever so many years ago, we, we were into parallel processing right from the beginning. You know, get on to stuff because you've got limited time. You don't have, and we never even imagined uh, the kinds of technology advances that we have today. It was not even there. And I remember, and this might seem a bit silly, that uh, when a friend of mine gave me uh, the first uh, software to do my figures and my graphs for my thesis, and I was so grateful to this friend because uh, otherwise I would have had to sit with stencils and uh, paper and I would have had to draw my graphs with, uh, you know, pen and ink. And, and here for the first time, and I remember this, the name of the software was called Cricket Graph. I still remember that. And I think I nostalgically even have the... Uh, the diskette on which that cricket graph, <laughs> the software was loaded because, my God, for the first time, I could do my figures, you know, just like that. This was part one of Zeroing In with Dr. Renee Maria Borges. With her infectious passion and love for anything and everything alive, Dr. Borges takes us into an entirely different world. So close to us, yet so much more to be understood. These were excerpts from our conversation with her. Stay tuned as we delve further into her current research work and more about life as a whole in the part two of the episode coming up next week. Until then, thank you for listening to Zeroing End.